in a way, I think your era was quite unique. Uh, uh, this, this, you were also appointed by the NDA government previously, then the UPA government came in, uh, and so you had a different finance minister than the one that had appointed you. Um, and uh, also during this period, we had this financial crisis, uh, which uh, uh, brought challenges that were quite different from uh, what one faces in, in the day-to-day -day running of the central bank uh, when, when things are moving in a more normal fashion. So whichever way you, you want to interpret no, slice I, this, please. In fact, I will start, for, I'll start with a quotation from, someone, from Professor Manmohan Singh himself. Uh, he said that uh, the job of governor is the most lonely job uh, in India. So it is somewhat uh, tough position in the sense that there is no independence in, in terms of legal or uh, in, in many ways it is the least independent governor in the world. At the same time, I think there is a tradition of a governor commanding some respect. So that was the main uh, source of strength. Second, personally, I had occasion to work with most of these political leaders at some stage or other before. So there was never a distrust, even when there were disagreements. That's the second strength. And third, of course, is that uh, since I was already 62 and I was made governor, I was not keen to have that job. And that both the opposition and the ruling party knew. So that gave uh, another, what I may call the, the typical non-attachment. Uh, so I could pursue Nishkama Karma Yoga. So. And I still remember when there were serious differences with the government. What are the differences? At the end of it, nobody had any mistrust. That gives a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I think uh, the would lucky in the sense I had uh, outstanding predecessors, both uh, Dr. Jalan and Rangarajan, and they created a unique framework for uh, monetary and finance policy in the country. We were not uh, entirely in step with the rest of the world. 1992, who talked about short-term credit? Uh, restricting short-term credit mm -hmm. and uh, limiting current account deficit to sustainable level. That was what Dr. Rajan did. The type of uh, mix of public and private. So it was not ideologically driven. It was awareness of the intellectual debates, awareness of the uh, of the international practices, uh, but everything was designed to suit the Indian conditions. Mm -hmm. So I had the unique advantage of working both with Rangarajan and with Jalan and with Professor Manmohan Singh for 30 years. So I think uh, uh, I have been a good disciple, uh, well well trained uh, to do the job. You're always so modest, not really. Uh, okay, so no, there were times that there was sort of differences between you and Finance Minister Chidambaram at the time. Um, tell us a little bit about those, how they played out <laughs> in the end. Actually, uh, they, in Singapore, the fund bank meeting, normally I used to avoid sitting at the same dais because it's very difficult to, uh, and we had a lot of differences. Uh, but in a, a question was raised and we happened to be in a dinner and the uh, chief of this Confederation of Indian Industry exactly raised this question. The, he said that we are getting confusing signals. The finance minister says something, the governor is the government, they say something different and we don't know what to make of this and since both of them are here, I would like uh, clarification on this. So then I naturally said, uh, I'm sure the finance minister will clarify. So that's how the governor's position is. Uh, and then the finance minister got up and said, gentlemen, I always assured you growth. Governor assured you stability. Together we are producing both growth and stability. What are you complaining about? I suppose that sums up the situation in, in true democratic tradition. Uh, but I can say that we were not uh, argumentative, but we're questioning each other. And even when we deferred, at the end of it, both the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister felt that there is an institutional responsibility and institutional accountability. So if you want to take a stand, as long as you are prepared to own it up, privately and publicly, take a stand and take the responsibility for it, they said, okay, go ahead and do that. And I think that, that is very important. But on the regulatory side, in the, on the regulatory side, it would have been impossible for me to move one step and much of strength of the Indian financial sector is the regulatory, counter-cyclical regulation uh, and weeding out all the weak banks. And you know 80% of the banks are owned um, by the government in India. So the government's cooperation in whatever we are doing was uh, available, except uh, it was a little more painful in terms of explaining, convincing, and sometimes uh, differing. Uh, but uh, it is, so if you ask me in the final analysis, uh, the, the credit has to go to the government. Uh, for permitting the independence. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Um, just one last question let me ask you. So, 
we I think agree that India still needs to deregulate a bit on the um, financial sector. Um, at the same time, there has to be prudential regulation also. Um, there are certain things I'm sure you did so differently, which is why India was so little impacted by the financial crisis that happened. How far would you, in, in what way would you today kind of deregulate and, and what are the kind of specific regulations you think are worth keeping uh, so that in the case of a crisis, even if we are a lot more deregulated than today, when the crisis comes in, we are still in strong shape. I think the first stage is to identify the weaknesses in our financial sector. There are some weaknesses. I don't think the insurance industry is strong. It's infant, but in terms of many of the instruments, uh, they are not. Um, so I, I would give a, a, a careful look at the regulatory regime of the insurance sector. It's extremely important. You, 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 you wouldn't know the importance at this stage because it's still uh, developing and evolving. Second, the non-banking financial companies. Uh, the mutual funds. Uh, for instance, the mutual funds will have a situation where 70 to 80 percent of the f amount for the mutual funds comes only from corporates and banks. They're not from the retail investors. And they get the tax breaks. With the result, the mutual funds are operating, keeping the interest of the corporates and banks in view and not the retail investors. Whereas the objective is to serve the re retail investors. So, and they, there is sort of a uh, not easily recognizable linkage. Uh, uh, between uh, non-banking financial companies, corporates, uh, mutual funds. And these are uh, potentially, as they grow, uh, areas which require attention. So I think in, the, in certain of those areas, you have to be more effective regulation, uh, more purposeful regulation. Uh, in the banking system, I think the concentration on uh, traditional banking uh, will, is necessary. But in the process of encouraging the market development, Sometimes the policy is encouraging banks to play in the markets. You want to, de 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 you have to develop debt markets, you have to develop this, develop that. With the result, there is a hollowness in the banking in terms of what they should be doing, namely lending, retail lending for agriculture, for small and medium industries. Ultimately, the resources are limited. And you would be surprised to know that the, as a percentage of GDP, the amount, uh, as a percentage of the amount invested in equity is constant. In India, it's constantly really? yes. Wow. The people of India, by and large, this is by the banks, you mean, or or overall, the, the, uh, overall, overall. overall. Ah. But basically, even that, basically, it's the banks which are doing it. My limited point is the retail investor, by and large, still prefers depositing in the bank, hmm. and for the retail investor, they have not the, the equity markets do not provide much comfort. So I think we have to be careful about the ensuring that the banking does the job of banking hmm. at our level of development. That's important. And thirdly, in the process, for instance, infrastructure. Infrastructure financing, which is a long-term financing, we should not be diverting banks too much into infrastructure uh, because there will be mismatch. And, and that's not a specialization. So some of these correctives, I would say. Just one more question I want to actually bring you to. Uh, this is something we were talking last night about the crisis that sort of quasi-crisis that has happened on the microfinance. So maybe, you know, if you can also define exactly what is going on and what your take is on, on that. I think See, basically I would, uh, we, we, the Reserve Bank of India took a lead in terms of financial inclusion first. And we should make it, and we articulated, we should make a distinction between microfinance Microcredit and financial inclusion. Microfinance, microcredit emphasizes giving credit, but the financial inclusion emphasizes making financial services available, including taking a deposit, transferring a payment, making a payment, getting temporary advances. So I think that is the most important distinction, and uh, we have to concentrate on financial inclusion rather than microfinance. Number one, mm -hmm. as a policy, in microfinance, again I'll quote um, Nobel laureate. Uh, Mohammed Yunus, when he visited the Reserve Bank at my request, he said, uh, we asked him to explain, he said, any microfinance institution which works for profit is absolutely no different from a money lender. And I think that is right. 
because of the fact that the motivation, the incentive is profit maximization. And then all the, in what way does it differ from money lender? At least in the case of money lender, he's lending his own money or her own money. And secondly, he is living in the society and therefore he cannot be totally irresponsible. And the strength of microfinance is informality. Once you institutionalize it, the informality is gone. And once uh, you, you also uh, allow it for profit, so both together uh, can create a problem. And there can be sort of unethical methods. And this is what was uh, suspected. And it has now come to the fore. Exactly in the state in which the maximum microfinance, you must understand, you don't think that it is only a localized phenomena. 40% of total microfinance activity traditionally was in Andhra Pradesh, in the country. South India accounts for 65%. And so today, if the MFIs are in trouble in Andhra, people keep saying that it's localized. Of course, it is not. It is represented to the country. If you ask me what should be the, our approach, in my view, we have seen for 50 years, there's no point in believing, given the nature of our economy and the nature of our society and the nature of economic activity, you cannot wish away money lenders. And therefore, it is far better to have a regulated money lenders business. And any for-profit MFI also should be covered by that legislation. That's my view. Okay. Okay. Thank you.